so I am here today to talk to you about my top 10 favourite books of all time. So I've been making bookish videos on the internet for more than eight years now and I have actually done this video or something like it twice before. It was one of the very first videos I ever uploaded right at the end of 2012 and I also uploaded a version of this a few years ago. But the thing is you read a lot over time and your favourite books sometimes change. Some of them don't and it's fun to see the books that just consistently make it onto this list every time I sit down to rethink it. But otherwise there's a few that definitely haven't featured on favourite books of all time lists before because I hadn't read them and I've really grown to love them. Some of them I've even, even read multiple times <laughs> um, since I had a chance to film one of these videos and I also just think it's nice for subscribers old and new to either be refreshed or introduced to the books that like I love above all others and I always love an opportunity to talk about them and tell you why I love them and re-articulate that. So as you can guess I have 10 books here or 10 series as well because some of these I can't pick one book from the series, it's the series that's a favourite and I'm going to talk to you about them today. So without further ado let's crack on with one that's not made it onto one of these lists in the past but will nevertheless come as no surprise to you because I have talked about this author and this book at every available opportunity and it is of course Daughter of the Forest by Juliette Morellier. Now I have to say equal to my love of this book is my love of book two in the series which is Son of Shadows. So these are books one and two in the Seven Waters series by Juliette Morellier. And what is particularly nice about these, or well, works very well with the series, is that these have different protagonists. So these are intergenerational novels about women from the same family, which is the Seven Waters family. So we have the first generation in The Daughter of the Forest, then we have the second generation of the same family in Son of the Shadows, and for that reason we have a different protagonist. And both are incredibly strong, determined, um, like forceful, securing themselves, growing, budding young women in their own right and for different reasons. Like they're both strong but they're both very different personality wise and they show their strength in very different ways and they have their own stories and I love that like book two is not just a repetition of book one but if you love book one then you will probably no doubt love book two because it has a lot of the same charm but I will focus on book one for now because if you've not read the series then this is presumably where you're going to start. Now book one like all the books in the series of which there are six is set in medieval Ireland and one of the things I think, think is significant about this series is that yes it is fantasy but more than anything it feels like historical fiction so for me this book is like reading a slow paced intricately woven historical fiction novel set in medieval Ireland but with an incorporation of sort of medieval Irish folklore and the fae in particular. So it is a retelling of a fairy tale but I'm not going to tell you what that fairy tale is, you can look it up if you want but if you don't know the fairy tale and you don't know what fairy tale this is retelling it may take you a little bit to realise and that way um, things may come as more of a surprise to you because it is very slowly paced. The events of the blurb definitely don't happen until like at least a quarter of the way through because you have tons of setup, you get to know the characters and their background and important aspects of their development that come into play later on early in the book before necessarily the like big sort of moment that pushes the plot forward and I love that. I think this is so beautiful because the main character Sorka feels so real, she feels so alive and we see her grow up. We see her from a young girl um, leading into her teenage years and then the main events of the book themselves take place over more than a year I believe it is. I forget exactly how long but it's quite a lengthy period of time and this is a little mass market paperback but it's still pretty chunky and comes in at over 500 pages almost 600 with quite small text so you get an idea of the length and what you're committing yourself to but what I will say as well when I read this book is that 
It is slow paced and I started off reading it quite slowly but you get to a point in the story where it's impossible to put down. I felt genuine anxiety over the character's fate in this book and could not put it down. The evening in which I had to just eventually go to sleep before finishing this book, I had dreams about it because I was so concerned for Sorka and her story and I needed to know what would happen. It never felt absolutely certain that everything was going to work out and in that sense there are definitely darker themes in here. There is an incident of sexual violence in this book but I think it's very very well handled although explicit. So if you aren't in the right frame of mind to deal with that then that's just a heads up because I know I have to be in the right frame of mind to deal with reading those kind of topics or not reading those kind of topics but it's not a spoiler to say it happens and it is handled in a way that is in no way one of those like awful incidents that are terribly common in fantasy where um, sexual violence is used to further the uh, development of say a male character or demonstrate the uh, evilness or uh, bad nature of another antagonistic character. It is really for me a feminist fantasy novel. I feel in great part as if Juliet Merillier turns a lot of fancy tropes on their head in this novel. She's very careful and very considerate when dealing with more serious issues and how they affect our female protagonist. And it is about voicelessness and action and um, sort of having, making your mark in a world that does not put women first because it is medieval Ireland, it is a historical setting where women's rights are not necessarily the same as men right, men's rights. Um, but we just see this strength in the character and I, I like I cannot rave about this more highly. Whether or not you're a fantasy reader, I think this is worth a shot. If you like historical fiction but don't tend to gravitate towards fantasy, you may very well still like this because it feels like historical fiction. Like I said, the fae crop up here and there, there is a curse, there are little pockets of magic, but the characters are mortal and their struggles, although affected by magic, hearken to very mortal issues. I still haven't reread this but I downloaded it on an audiobook having read it originally and really look forward to reading the whole series from the beginning again. We then have another little mass market paperback so let's just carry on with those but this is one that's definitely been in favourite videos in the past so maybe I'll spend less time on it but it's Going Postal by Terry Pratchett. So Terry Pratchett is one of my favourite authors of all time. This is another fantasy novel although very different in tone far 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 more like heavy on the magic and the magical creatures and the wacky sort of otherworldly incidents <laughs> because Terry Pratchett in particular writes comedic fantasy set on this planet or world that he has named the Discworld. So he's created this whole world which is a disc shaped planet that rides on the back of four elephants that ride on the back of a giant turtle through space <laughs> of course. Um, although it's definitely fantasy rather than science fiction. And he wrote in his lifetime at least 40 books, I believe, set on the Discworld, but this is hands down my favourite of the ones I've read. I've read 20 something, like I've read more than half of them, I haven't read all. And I have read this book probably um, the most of all of the books in this video. I have reread this book so many times, I can like talk along with portions of the audiobook, I love it. And it's about Moise von Lipvig who is a ex-con man, <laughs> well he doesn't necessarily want to be an ex-con man but he's a con man on death row about to be hung and he is, he is hung within an inch of his life literally only to wake up in the patrician's office who is the ruler of Ankh Morpork, the sort of mercantile capital of this planet and given a choice. He can, you know, go back be hung or he can try and go straight, he can become an ex-con man and he can restore to its former greatness the Ankh Morpork Postal Service which has just fallen into absolute disrepair. And it sounds like a bit of a silly mission but it turns out to be a little more dangerous than Moist expected who the whole time is just kind of trying to figure out how he can get out of this and run back to his old way of life but has to sort of like play it safe in the meantime um, so that he doesn't get caught but then maybe he ends up becoming slightly attached to some of the characters he meets throughout his adventure trying to restore the post office and maybe like ends up accidentally becoming um, the good guy and rather than the antagonist and I love him. He is absolute peak anti-hero um, for me and I really like that kind of character sort of trope. Like I love anti-hero characters, characters that 
aren't doing things necessarily for the right reason but end up doing the right things. Those characters are a lot of fun for me and this book is obviously hilarious. I genuinely think it's one of the funniest pieces of literature I've ever written, ever. Although I do have another book that very much uh, vies for that position in this video. And I just adore it. It really just like encompasses everything I love about the Discworld books and they are some of my favourite books in general. Like the series again is one that would be a favourite series um, I'd have to say but this is definitely my favourite and if you've not come across the Discworld before, although there are 40 books in it, you don't have to read them in publication order because although they're all set on the same planet, they follow different characters so there are series within series and this is the first book in Moist's series so there are three books following Moist and you can start with this one. I do have a whole video on where to start with the Discworld though explaining the whole sort of makeup of the series and I'll link that down below for anybody interested. I then have a book completely different in tone because let's just, you know, continue to jump around. I love jumping around between very different books um, when I read and when I talk about books. So we then have Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson. This is a novel, as are all the books in this video. I don't think I necessarily said, but these are my top 10 favourite novels as opposed to like poetry books or non-fiction books. But it's also semi-autobiographical or like very autobiographical in fact because it is Jeanette Winterson's first published novel that was inspired by her life and she has also since brought out an autobiography, uh, Why Be Happy When You Can Be Normal, that I've also read and like I said, very, very similar and I believe Jeanette Winterson admits to that herself that this book is inspired by her life although she changes small elements of it and weaves in little tiny bits of magic realism which I adore. But all in all, it feels like a very contemporary novel if set in the 1950s uh, when uh, Jeanette Winterson was growing up in Northern England. So if you're not like into fantasy and magic realism, I don't think you need to be to read this book because the magic realism is very, 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 very light. In fact, this is one of the most contemporary novels I have read by Jeanette Winterson. Not the only one, but one of the most. And it's probably my favourite book by an author who, again, I just adore. I have read quite a few books by Jeanette Winterson and have adored numerous of them. Wait's another favourite, which is a retelling of a incident from Greek mythology. But this is probably my favourite because this is the most heart-wrenching, emotional, but hopeful and joyful book at the same time. It is about a young girl called Jeanette growing up in Northern England in the 1950s in a very religious household. She was adopted and her parents, her mother in particular, are very, very, very religious and the church that she attends uh, with her mother is not open to homosexuality and Jeanette realises quite early on that she herself is gay and that she is exclusively interested in other women. And it's about that journey, it's about her journey coming out, coming to terms with her sexuality, finding love, finding first loves and second loves within this environment, the rejection she faces at home, in her church, the communities that she's a part of, but also the places in which she finds solace. And one of those places is herself and that is one of my favourite things about this novel. One of the most beautiful things in this novel I think would be so encouraging um, to anyone struggling with coming out is that Jeanette very much throughout this story never tries to deny who she is like she knows how she feels and sometimes she has to hide it and pretend in order to be safe and to get along in her community which is incredibly unfortunate and thankfully she's able to escape that but she never turns that into self-loathing, which as I'm sure you're aware is not the case for everybody, but it's so empowering I think to see somebody just consistently love themselves and never deny themselves their sexuality. I think it's a very inspiring storyline and what brings the hope to the whole tone of this novel that could otherwise just be completely disheartening and depressing and make you want to give up. It's a story that does the complete opposite and is beautifully written. Jeanette Winterson has the most gorgeous prose. This is true of everything she writes. Like she just turns a beautiful sentence. She knows how to thread her words together and that is true of this book as much as any if not more. <laughs> 
I did mention there was another comedic book in this video though and it's another one that will come as no surprise I'm sure because it is the comedic science fiction equivalent of Going Postal which is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. This is the first of Douglas Adams' uh, trilogy of five as he called it or five books that all follow Arthur Dent, a hapless human main character that ends up hitchhiking the galaxy with his best friend Ford Prefect who until the very beginning of this novel he never realised was actually an alien. He thought Ford was a human just like him but with a slightly odd name. A name that Ford chose from for himself when he landed on Earth because he assumed that cars were the dominant species on the planet only to discover they were humans surprisingly. Surprise surprise. <laughs> And um, like I said, they end up going hitchhiking throughout the galaxy and it's completely bonkers, it's completely ridiculous. It is all about humanity and how tiny we are and how hapless we are. Arthur Dent is the everyman in this situation. He just cannot believe the position he's in. He never dreamed of space travel. This was not what he wanted for his life, but this is where he's ended up and he's just trying to make the best of it. And it's, like I said, just completely bonkers, completely wacky, so entertaining, full of so many jokes and pop culture references like the meaning of life being 42, a joke you will only truly get if you read the first couple of books in this series and trust me it's fun to find out what it means and just an absolute classic both in the sci-fi and comedy genres. Douglas Adams was such a witty writer, such a clever, clever writer who makes lots of little jibes and puns at uh, the contemporary world and humanity. Although this book did originally come out in the 80s, it is still very relevant, I feel. Oh, sorry, I do apologise. It came out in 79, not the 80s. And I should have known that because this is an adaptation of the original radio production which came out in 1978 and last year was actually the 42nd anniversary of the original radio show also written by Douglas Adams and the radio show was so loved that Douglas Adams quite clearly very shortly after writing the radio show adapted into a book it has been performed as a play on stage it has been turned into a television series and a film and I'm sure will continue to be reimagined in the future and I absolutely love every iteration every iteration brings something new I think particularly because up until now pretty much every iteration has had Douglas Adams own stamp on it because he was involved in writing it, even the film he was involved in, although he passed away before it came out. And they are just so much fun, so entertaining. I consume it in every format I can and maybe this I have read as many times as Going Postal. I still feel like maybe I've read Going Postal more but I've definitely read it a close second of the books in this video. Now I think we will enter into what I'm going to describe as the mythology theme section of this video. If you don't know me, if this is the first video you're watching on my channel, then you may not know that I am a ancient historian. I am hoping to submit my PhD thesis this year. My entire life from about 2010 when I first started university has been all about classics and mythology and ancient history and I have even written my own book in the genre but let's talk about some of my favourite books that deal with mythology, two of which are retellings and one of which is an actual piece of ancient literature itself. I say mythology, this book does interact with a Greek myth and it does interact with Greek gods but it is not a myth in itself. This is one of the ancient Greek novels which are five pieces of ancient Greek literature that survive today that were originally written in prose. So until the Hellenistic era, all ancient Greek fiction was written in poetic meter or it was written as a play. It was never written in prose, only philosophy or history was written in prose until the ancient Greek novel as it's sort of known today by classicists. And this is one of those five. This was written during the Roman Empire by a Greek have I even mentioned what it's called? It's Daphnis and Chloe by Longus and it's the only piece of literature we have surviving from this author and it is a slightly comedic romance novel. It's only about 80 pages long in this edition which is the Oxford World Classic translated by Ronald McHale. It was the book 
that made up a third of my undergraduate dissertation and as soon as I read this book I fell in love. I studied it in my third year at university, my undergrad was four years long in total and from that first page I was captivated by the whole concept of the ancient Greek romance novel and this in particular because it's quite subversive. If you read all five and read a little bit of non-fiction on the subject of the five books that survive in, in this genre you will understand why it's so subversive but if you don't read all five and you might not want to because they're not all quite as entertaining as standalone novels you can still very much enjoy this because it's just great fun and it's also a fantastic example of how accessible classical literature is you may think that because something was written in antiquity more than two thousand years ago although I suppose this was not quite two thousand years ago but around about two millennia ago it may be tricky for a modern reader to understand but although sometimes the sensibilities differ this book is so readable so accessible, so enjoyable for modern readers even if you've never read any Greek literature before and I think it's a great jumping in point because of that it just sort of breaks down those barriers but then goes on to have more layers if you read more and that is just a wonderful thing in my opinion. The plotline itself is about Daphnis and Chloe, two young people, a shepherdess and a goat herd who have grown up together on this island and they have reached puberty, they are at a pivotal point in their life where they're starting to feel attraction to the opposite sex in their cases and to each other specifically but they don't know what to do with these feelings how do they explore these feelings what are these feelings and the whole book is basically them trying to figure it out so I couldn't recommend this one more highly if you're interested in ancient literature if I have any relevant videos to any of these books I'll link them down below for example I'm pretty sure I have a video on my top 10 favorite pieces of ancient literature I think I have my top 10 fantasy although that's probably changed as well and I'll link them down below we then have one that I want to mention next because it's one I don't think a lot of people realise contains mythological intertextuality and that's The Vegetarian by Han Kang. Now you do not need to know that this references mythology, you do not need to know anything about the mythology it references to enjoy it because this is a phenomenal standalone novel but the added layers of mythological reference really just like give it that extra oomph for me as somebody that's super into that. And this is a South Korean novel about a woman who essentially is struggling with her mental health but at the conception of this novel she decides that she's going to become a vegetarian and this is something that is not common culturally amongst um, her family and her community so people react quite like dubiously to this and really try to pressure her into eating meat and that is effectively what this book is about. It's about the outside pressure that this woman faces and that women face. And what is also significant about the way the story is told is we never really get her perspective. There are little moments in the very third section where we see inside her mind, but each of the three sections itself is told from the perspective of someone outside of the main character. So the first chapter is told from the perspective of her husband who very much just sees her as like a convenient maid and cook and um, person to have around the house rather than feeling any real love for her. The second chapter is told from the perspective of her sister's husband who becomes sexually infatuated with her and then the third chapter is from the per perspective of her sister who doesn't really understand what's going on with the main character but also wants to support her sister and um, help her but doesn't know how and is just like on the other side of what is going on looking in and it is such a fascinating story because you are seeing what is being done to this woman from the perspective particularly in chapters one and two of the people doing the things to her and forcing her into a position she doesn't want to be in and taking advantage of her. It's translated by Deborah Smith which I think is important to point out with piece of translated literature because for me that um, created part of the reading experience like I can't read Korean so I would never have read this book if it wasn't for Deborah Smith and she brings the story to life and in that respect it's just such a phenomenal collaboration. I imagine that Han Kang's prose are stunning in the Korean, I haven't read them in the Korean but um, Deborah Smith like I said does a stunning job of translating them and, and giving me an idea of what I would have experienced in the original Korean. It's just beautifully, beautifully written, such vivid imagery, really like ooh like twists your stomach and your insides and makes you a little bit uncomfortable um, but also just so emotional and attached to the character. If you're interested though in the mythological side of this story there is direct parallels throughout the entire narrative to the myth 
of uh, Daphne and Apollo. Now in the myth of Daphne and Apollo, Daphne is fleeing Apollo the god who wants to um, take her for his own but she does not want him and he is not taking no for an answer so she must flee. And Han Kang actually studied classics and that comes through in this book and the intertextuality comes through in this book and what she's doing in this story is creating something new but that draws on the themes of the myth and I really just think that adds an extra layer when you know that and you can know that before or after and it's, I still think it adds that layer and still adds to your appreciation of the novel. We then, last but not least, for the mythological section have a very uh, explicit retelling of a Greek myth and that is the Penelope Act by Margaret Atwood. Now this is a retelling of the Odyssey by Homer which is all about the journey of Odysseus travelling back from the Trojan War to his home in Ithaca where his wife Penelope has been waiting for him for about 20 years. Now in this version, in Margaret Atwood's version, we follow Penelope's perspective. So we get the perspective of the wife sitting at home waiting for her husband as everything is falling apart around her because her husband has been gone for so long, everyone has assumed he is dead and there are all these suitors who have turned up at her palace to claim her as their wife to woo her or force her into marriage in order to claim the kingdom that Odysseus has left behind. She however is certain that her husband will still return home and is trying to hold out. Now this book is a favourite for a few reasons. It is beautifully written. It does a wonderful job of incorporating three different uh, sort of perspectives and timelines. We have the main timeline, we have Penelope in the afterlife after everything has happened, narrating the story and her feelings to what happened and also these chorus interludes from the slave women who served Penelope who have a major role in the story and are also treated incredibly unfairly by Odysseus in particular although you could very easily say by Penelope as well and it is beautiful because it incorporates the style of a chorus in a tragic Greek play so those sections are written I don't know if you can see in verse which is really nice because it incorporates different genres of Greek literature not only is this retelling Greek myth but it incorporates forms of Greek literature which I just think is stunning and it's also the book that really cemented my love of Greek mythology as an adult or as a teenager. I read this when I was 14 and it was my first exposure to adult literature that dealt with Greek mythology and I fell in love. I loved the reading experience. It introduced me to Mark Atwood who's also a favourite author. It introduced me to the whole genre of adult retellings of Greek mythology which I adore and I have so many more favourites of. I think I have a video dedicated to Greek mythology retelling favourites. If I haven't I need to film it but I think I do and if I do I'll link it down below. But because this is the one that sort of introduced me to that genre and I first fell in love with it remains my favourite. It's also the one I've read the most. I don't think I've reread any other of my Greek myth retellings. I would love to reread Circe because that could easily become a favourite but this I've reread three times and I don't think you need to read the Odyssey to read this because I hadn't. I've now read the Odyssey but I hadn't when I read this and in fact I think if you're daunted by something like the Odyssey reading something like this might be a way to ease yourself into it. It's a feminist retelling and I've found over the years ever since I read this I am particularly drawn to Greek myth retellings that focus on the female perspective that give voice to women of myth who do not have um, necessarily the same degree of uh, voice in the original material as the male characters. We then have another one which is 100% a series because I cannot pick a single favourite novel or short story from this series. It is of course, if you know me, Sherlock Holmes. Now I love Sherlock Holmes. I have been an avid Sherlock Holmes fan since I was like 11. I first was introduced to Sherlock Holmes explicitly in the form of the Jeremy Brett television series adaptation which came out in the late 80s, early 90s and I still love that adaptation. Jeremy Brett is Sherlock Holmes for me. As soon as I'd watched a few episodes of that series I had to read the originals and ever since then I have reread and reread and reread these stories because they are wonderful. These are the collections I first read. In fact this was the first book of Sherlock Holmes stories I ever read and it's the four novels. So Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote four novels following Sherlock Holmes and Watson and a huge selection of short stories, all of which which were originally published in the Strand magazine in the late 1800s and early 1900s. They begin in one novel which is a study 
Lizzie in Scarlet. So this is the novel in which Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson meet. You do not need, I mean this is the kind of reader I am, I feel this with a lot of series, you do not need to start at the beginning, you don't have to read a study in Scarlet first. For me, I did read a study in Scarlet first, but I'd already seen some adaptations of the other short stories, so I don't know what that counts for, and then I didn't then read them all in order after that. But at the same time, it is quite nice to find out how these two famous characters met and came together and joined up and became a team and ended up living together in shared accommodation. So that is one of my favourite things about A Study in Scarlet. It's not my favourite mystery, but I love all of the background and the development of this relationship in it. To me as a reader, Sherlock Holmes is always read as asexual and him and Watson are just like the best of friends. They have this very special, unique relationship. I know other people interpret them as lovers or in love with each other and like, you do you. I think both interpretations are absolutely fine. And I think both interpretations mean a lot to different people in terms of representation. So like I said, I would never dismiss one or the other. Um, but I love the relationship between Watson and Holmes. Like I love the friendship, whether you then consider it a romance or not, uh, between them. Because I just think it is so nice to read a book series about like an absolute team. Now Watson has nothing on Holmes in terms of analytical prowess or mystery solving ability but he adds something to Sherlock Holmes life and he also makes him accessible to readers because all of these stories are narrated by Watson. These stories are told to us by Watson as if he's recording the adventures he has been on with Holmes. And this is important because Holmes is not a relatable character. He was never written as a relatable character. He, Watson was written as that everyman character to give us that insight and also to slightly distance us from the mystery solving. One of the things that I love about Sherlock Holmes is that you cannot solve the mysteries. I think there's two types of mystery novels. There's mystery novels with clues in which you can come to a conclusion and see if you're right at the end. There's mystery novels where you just don't know what is important and do not have any idea of what's going to happen because the important clues and the important information are never given to you and that's what Sherlock Holmes is. Sherlock Holmes sees everything that's important, he finds clues but he doesn't tell Watson necessarily and Watson doesn't spot them so you as the reader never know about them until the end in which Sherlock Holmes reveals his solved case and I love those revelations. I love that about Sherlock Holmes. I love the characters, I love the mysteries, I love the stories. They are quintessential classic crime. They've had such an influence on pretty much all other crime novels and I love watching and reading reimaginings of these characters. Watson's actually one of my favourite characters of all time in literature. We then have a book I don't actually have a physical copy of, although I do, but it is a beat up old hardback copy with no dust jacket and a missing one of the covers <laughs> um, of the hardback that is actually up in my attic right now and I'm not going to go and have a rummage around for when I could just pop in a nice picture of the actual front cover and that is Aragon. So Aragon is the first in the inheritance cycle by Christopher Paolini and I believe I'm correct in saying this is the only young adult series in this video. I specifically wanted to focus on YA and adult books um, because I feel like although I have a lot of favourite children's books I love them in a different way and I really 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 want to upload a video dedicated to my favourite children's books so I'm going to be doing that hopefully in the next month or so and you can look out for that if you're interested but yes Inheritance is the only YA book here so Aragon is for me the OG dragon book it's not the actual OG dragon book but for me it's the book that cemented my love of dragons and I am a dragon fanatic <laughs> I did want to give a slight honorary mention to another dragon book which I did bring through but now cannot see anywhere where have I put it? Here it is. Um, that just narrowly missed out being in this video but it's definitely my second favourite dragon book and that's Tooth and Claw by Joe Walton. Um, but I have a whole video dedicated to dragon books that I'll again link down below. There's going to be so many videos linked down below and this video is going to be like two hours long so I do apologise. I hope you have um, managed to grab a snack and a coffee whilst you've been here. <laughs> and Aragon is about Aragon, a young man go growing up in Allegasia, which is a high fantasy, medieval-esque world, and one day, whilst hunting in the wood, he comes across a stone. But it's not a stone, is it? It's a dragon's egg, and he takes this big, glowing, beautiful stone home with him um, to the farm where he lives with his uncle and his cousin, only for it to hatch 
and him to discover that he is the latest dragon rider and the first, in fact, in decades because there is only one other known dragon rider in Alagasia at the moment who is the evil king that rules the entire land. Dragon riders used to be much more popular, there was far far more of them back in the day long before Aragorn was alive, however the king, this evil king who was a dragon rider ended up slaying most of them in his attempt to take over Alagasia and they are now no more until now and Aragorn and because he is the latest dragon rider and he has just hatched the first dragon known in decades um, he's obviously a bit of a target especially for this king but also for others or if not a target a, a point of interest for the rebellion and everyone wants his attention and at the same time he's just completely out of his depth, thrown into a new situation that he was not prepared for, that he never desired but doesn't have really any choice about. I must suddenly grow up at the end of the day. But one of my favourite things throughout this series is not just the intricate world building, it's not just the whole cast of interesting characters, it's the friendships. The friendships in this book are stunning. Aragorn's friendship with numerous characters throughout this book are just fantastic, but in particular his relationship with his dragon, Saphira. Saphira is the quintessential dragon for me. There is no dragon superior to Saphira. In fact, my first ever house plant that I bought back here, this arrowhead plant, is called Saphira. That's how much I love her. Saphira is everything a dragon should be to me, and Alagasia is just the most fantastic world. It's so complex, there's all these political factions, there's so much world building, there's drama and high stakes and secrets and mysteries and friendships, and I cannot rave more highly about this series. It's another one I've read multiple times. I love every single book in it. I think it's phenomenal. You can take your Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings because The Inheritance Cycle is the fantasy series that I will bow down before above all else. <laughs> then last but not least we have a fantasy romance and this book is actually in my favourites as a romance book more than a fantasy book. It's a bit like Daughter of the Forest in that although it's fantasy I feel its primary genre is something else and in this case it's romance and that is Radiance by Grace Draven. Eldeco is a human woman whilst Brishin is one of the Kai, a fantastic fantastical race of creatures in this world and they are part of an arranged marriage between their two people to sort of cement an alliance and they are very willing to get into this marriage. They always knew that their marriage would be a political one, that it wouldn't really be up to them and they are pretty amicable from day one. They understand the situation they're, they're in, they don't expect to fall in love, they don't even necessarily expect to get on but they're like, you know, just hoping that the other person will be a good person and that they can like you know, chug along quite contentedly together as a couple that brings their two people together. However, from the very beginning, they just take to one another. And I mean take to one another in just a complete alliance of personalities and build this friendship. And that is what is the foundation of this book for me. That from the beginning, they go into it with complete respect for one another. There's no pressure on the other person to have a romantic relationship. They find that certain qualities in the other person align with qualities that they have, but they're also able to encourage wonderful things in the other person and bring out wonderful things in the other person and get to know one another. And that respect and that friendship is what creates the most beautiful romance I have ever read in my life. Their relationship is the best role model for a relationship that I've ever read in a book. They may be royalty from two different species in a fantasy world but there is no better role model for a respectful relationship and if you are so sick of all of the unequal power dynamic, slightly toxic and unhealthy romances in a lot of romance literature then you need to read this whether you're a fantasy fan or not because it's beautiful. And there is a fantasy plot, subplot, there is a little bit of drama but at the end of the day it's a romance more than anything else and, and a development of a relationship that's more than a romance that is a, a friendship and a partnership and everything in between and that is just stunning to me. But those however are my top 10 favourite novels and series. I hope you have enjoyed this little update on the theme of this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these books, whether you've read them, did you read them because I've recommended them in videos, I know I've raved about all of these individually in the past and I'd also love to hear about some of your favourite books, especially if you think I'd like them. I will like I mentioned like any relevant videos down in the description box as well as all the books I've mentioned and until next time happy reading, I'll see you all again soon, bye everyone!